Hello, and welcome to I Am Dad Podcast with your fatherhood authority, Kenneth Braswell. 30 minutes of wisdom, information, resources, and nuggets to help you on your fatherhood journey. Or maybe you're just curious and want to hear some real talk about fatherhood, family, and the minds of men. Well, guess what? We got you too. Sit back, grab your pad and pen, and maybe even bring a little something to sip on. Enjoy 30 straight minutes of fatherhood, family, and fun with the fatherhood authority. Kenneth Braswell. Welcome to I Am Dad Podcast. I'm your host, Kenneth Braswell. Thank you for joining us. We are in season three. Who would have thought? Three years. Um, I thought this was going to be a fad. I thought I would have done it for a couple of months, got tired of it, moved on to something else. And here we are three years into this thing. Um, and it's continuing to grow, continuing to influence. I'm very happy about where it's going, and I'm also very happy about the guests that we've already lined up for year three. So happy new year to all of you. Hope you all made it into 2024 well, in good spirits and in good health. I'm always praying for you. Um, And as my good friend uh, Darren Ferguson always says, I love you and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And so we're starting off 2024 with a bang. First of all, let me just take a moment to tell you that Fathers Incorporated is celebrating its 20th anniversary all year long. And so 20 years, right? (laughs) Who would have thought? And so here we are. Um, Our theme for 2024 is fatherhood forward, um, pioneering the path for a generation of new dads. Uh, We're looking forward to all of the things that we'll be doing this year, including a dinner in November to mark the actual um, anniversary on November 13th, somewhere in and around there. A couple of forums we got coming up with a report on Atlanta dads, black dads, particularly non-resident black dads in um, Fulton County. We'll be doing something at Pittsburgh Yards on February 20th. So we ask you to join that. Uh, We got the launch of several different things this year that we're going to be moving. And this year is just going to be a year of new collaboration, partnership, growth and beyond legacy. But today I have a good, good, good friend. And um, he is my mentor. I call him my mentor all the time. I don't know if he has accepted me as his mentee yet, but he was actually the first person I called when I got into the space and got hired. Um, within the New York State uh, Office of Temporary Dis- Dis- temporary Assistance. And I already get OTADA. That's what people affectionately call it. And so I remember uh, when um, Russ and um, Dorr, Robert Dorr at the time, uh, wanted to bring someone into the staff to talk about um, fatherhood, um, the only name that kept coming up was my guest today, Dr. Ron Mincy. And so he was gracious enough. I gave him a call. He didn't know me from a a can of paint, um, (laughs) but we came up and he wowed him. And then we actually, um, he did and and headed him and our good friend Elaine Sorsen, our comprehensive research and study over the program over, I believe, five or six years. That study spanned it for the work that we did in New York and had great results. And unfortunately, it kind of sunset it when all of the champions left the state of New York. When Robert Doerr went to New York City, David Hansel came to the state and then David Hansel went to the feds and then I left. And once I left, I think the program did not have any more um, allies at the state level. And unfortunately, the program um, sunset it. And we also had it and we'll talk a little bit about this not the first in the nation, but one of the first in the nation, uh, non custodial. Um, earn income tax credits um, in the nation, which also sunsetted, I believe, it like after seven years it sunsetted. So they no longer have that um, in New York as well. But my good friend who's with us today, Dr. Ron Mincy, his resume is impressive and long. I'll give you just a little bit. He's a professor of social policy and social work practice at Columbia University and a leading scholar on issues related to poverty, fatherhood, and family well-being. He has conducted influential research on the challenges and opportunities faced by low-income fathers, especially black men and their children. Um, And he's done so much more, including being a co-principal investigator of the Fragile Families and Child Well-Being Study. And we'll talk about that today as well. How you doing, Dr. Mitzi? I'm well. Uh, thank you for having me. 
and 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 as to the mentor, I don't know if that's an, an honor I deserve. You get you kept me saying at a time that I always tell people, I was like, you think this fatherhood work is hard now. You should have been here 20 years ago hey, trying well, to convince somebody um that fathers were worthy of a focus with respect to social programs. I remember I always tell the story about going around the state of New York and having to speak to um, domestic violence advocates <laughs> who were really against fatherhood at that time. Mm -hmm. And I just about a few weeks ago did a training um, to judges um, in the state of Missouri. Mm -hmm. And so, and I was telling them the story about the first time I had to go up to um, Northwestern um, New York, Buffalo, Rochester area to do mm -hmm. a training for all of the family magistrates of New York State. Mm -hmm. and it was about 75 judges in the room and I'm green as green can be. I'm about maybe a year into it and I'm up there doing my best fatherhood presentation, you know, and I'm looking out into the audience and I always tell the story that the room was broken into thirds. There was a third of the room who was shaking their head. They agreed with everything I said. There was a third of the room that was kind of on the fence. They didn't really know which way to go or not to go. And there was a third of the room, I believe, if they could have shot me dead right there on that podium, they would have shot me. <laughs> on that day and so um so i'm thankful for you know you keeping my san sanity during that time and sticking with this and getting to where we are today dr missy i always start off with something and i didn't put these on the questions that i shared with you before but i'm going to hit you with it now because it's kind of how we start off the show because i just think it's an interesting um aspect of who we are doing this work and i think it tells a lot about why we do this work tell me your daddy's story you can either tell it from the aspect of you being a daddy, or you could tell it from the point of view of your father, or you could tell both. So uh, I, I guess the daddy story that I'll tell you is, uh, you know, a story that I've learned from my sons and watching them be fathers. So uh, my oldest son is one of the best fathers I know. And uh, over the years, I've watched him uh, how in the way in which he interacts with his daughter. He's a single dad. Uh, and has been since she was, uh, you know, months old. But he read to her when she was in the womb, in, in her mother's womb. And I used to watch him as he interacted to her, with her uh, whenever he spoke with her, uh, particularly, uh, you know, had to correct her. He would always kneel down uh, and, and make sure that he was talking to her at, at eye level. And, and in many ways, and she's now uh, a very bright child, very... Uh, um, you know, very, very smart, very assured of herself, uh, you know, into all kinds of, she's a, a martial artist. She builds um, a very complicated models. Uh, she uh, is a, in, in a, uh, uh, a special uh, school, the, the Charter School of Wilmington. She's just uh, an amazing, amazing young, young lady. But I can see how uh, much of what she has accomplished and will accomplish was a, is a consequence of the expert uh, type of father that she has. And by the way, that does accord with research that indicates that um, uh, children who have fathers who are single who are single fathers, most men when they have a divorce or for one reason or another the mother is no longer in the picture, they will um, they will uh, develop new relationships with new women. Uh, because they can't imagine what it is to raise a child on their own. But uh, on the other hand, the exceptional fathers who do that and take on the responsibility of raising a child, these children turn out to be better, uh, better off in many ways, in part because they have really, really exceptional dads. And my, my son is one of them. Deru. <laughs> Yeah, I always love that story. You've always um, impressed me with the particular the piece of the um, conversation about reading. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. taken me over the course. I think when we first met, my son now is uh, he just turned 15 years old. Mm -hmm. So he was born about somewhat like four or five years after we met. But I remember you telling that story and I remember how important it was for me um, to read to him. And I think Nzinga was younger, so she was in a different space and I was able to read with them. Mm -hmm. But I always remember when we talk about or I hear the conversation about, and I could tell it in the kids because half of them I spent time reading with and the other half I didn't. You could actually see a visible difference between the children. It's very eerie. And sometimes you could see such a 
a notable difference that you can start getting down on yourself and feeling bad about not doing that yeah. um, with your other children. But you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah, there it is. You can always you can always do me course corrections, you know. And I I read to them when they when they were younger. But had I known what I know now, both as a consequence of doing research on child development, but but watching my own uh, children and grandchildren. You know the importance of reading, and particularly the reading that dads do, uh, is mm -hmm. really really critical to their uh, to their to their development. So that, that that that's a good place to begin. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of reading, and we could talk about this in another um, interview. But I've been doing a lot of reading about this thirty million word gap mm -hmm. um, with Absolutely. our children yeah. <clears throat> and what that looks like, particularly for um, low income African American and, and mm -hmm. children of color. Mm -hmm. um, where we don't use, I remember one time when my daughter was young and my mother was holding her and, you know, back in the day, you know, our parents used to go, goo goo, ga ga, ooh, you used to make noises. And I remember telling my mother, like, no, 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 <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Use real but, words with her. Yeah. But again, the research indicates that, you know, one of the ways in which men interact with children, fathers interact with children differently than mothers, is that they tend not to talk baby talk to them, but they talk to them as if they were adults. And as a result, children who have that experience have more extensive uh, uh, reflective vocabulary. They learn how to read earlier. And so, you know, the importance of having, you know, uh, moms and dads, because they bring different things to children and and they and children need the, the attributes of both. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's uh, it's yeah, but but what we don't know, we don't know, and fortunately, you know, we can do. I'll, I'll tell you another fatherhood story. Uh, when my granddaughter was born, um, I was uh, I had some kind of injury. I forget, uh, maybe knee surgery or something. And she would always go out with the kids, with the with my son and mom and my wife and stuff. And they would do Christmas shopping together, but I would never be able to go because I'm crutching around, you know, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and then on her, she went down to this big store in New York, uh, and and she brought me back this little uh, hand thing, uh, so that I could reach stuff, you know. And uh, and and I used to, uh, and my wife at one point told me, you know, Ron, she really really loves you. I have, you have to pay attention to her. And I began to sort of dial in to her uh, more and more and more. So what that tells me is that you know, um, uh, children have the capacity to forgive. And so whatever kind of mistakes that we make along the way, things that we haven't done perfectly, you know, they they, they have a capacity for to forgive. And therefore, you know, we can do mid-course corrections and win back, you know, uh, the affection and love and then have the opportunity that we need to dial into them and to give them what they need and in return receive what we, what we uh, as men need as well. So... Uh, Wow. It's a wow. full circle, you know. Mm -hmm. So what inspired you to get into this work? Was it a journey into it? Did you know? Did you figure it out once you got into it? What was the um the inspiration for you getting into this particular piece of work? Well, um, you know, my inspiration wasn't all that different than uh what many people of color, particularly boys, experience when they grow up without their fathers. You know, and I have a good friend in the field, his name is Ken Canfield. And uh, I think he was the one who coined the term a father hunger. I didn't grow up with my father. I didn't live with him. Uh, you know, I knew he existed. Uh, and my mother never, um, you know, disparaged him. But I always wondered what it was, what it would have been like uh, to grow up with with a, with with a father who, you know, opened doors for me and and uh, and just uh, facilitated, you know, my my transition. You know, I needed, I I wanted that. And so when I was, uh, when I was, I can remember this very clearly. Uh, I grew up in a, in a, in a housing project, one of the worst projects in New York city. Uh, and, uh, in the 1950s, it was built in 1952, but by the time I was three or four years old, um, it was, uh, it was a consolation prize for black GIs who couldn't, who, who were redlined out of buying housing in Harlem, uh, and therefore, the federal government, you know, created this housing project. And when my mother and father moved in, I was a baby in the, at the time, um, most of the families were two parent families, the families of GIs and their wives. But by the time I was, you know, uh, maybe four or five years old, it was a, 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 a housing complex. Uh, and most of the families, a, a majority of the families were, were led by single moms. And that's the context in which I grew up. So, um, 
you know, I always wondered, again, what it would be like. And when I became a teenager, I wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, and I wanted to have, uh, but I didn't have, you know, anyone who had the social capital who could introduce me to a lawyer and let me figure out what being a lawyer was all about, you know. Um, so I got a job for, uh, with the New York City, um, uh, there was called a neighborhood youth corps. And my job was to, I got a job working in the family court on the Grand Concourse in New York City. And my job was to go and uh, at the beginning of the day, I would, or the evening, I would go into the case files. I would bring out the cases that were going to be heard the next morning. Uh, and then uh, after the judge made a decision in a child support case, um, my job was to transcribe the judge's handwriting into to type up what the order was and then file back the order. Uh, and then uh, I, I could do that. Uh, and as long as I did that, I could go into the courtroom and then watch any hearing that was taking place throughout the whole building. Uh, and, and that was my way of, uh, of shadowing what a lawyer was going to be about. And so uh, one day it occurred to me that my mother's case must be in this file. And uh, it was like uh, uh, it, it changed my whole experience. Um, you know, I was I was supposed to be in the file room. That was my job. But right. over the next week or so, I snuck over and I got to the O's and the, the M N's and I got, found the M M file. I went in. I find M I N. Found my mother's case. I read my whole case history. A file that thick wow. uh, in that file, and I was furious. Mm. Uh, I was furious at what the court system had done to these uh, young parents who just had difficulty getting their act together. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, the many times my mother had to go back into the courtroom to try to force my father to pay uh, the child support that was owed and the, the, the value of the order that was set. I read the whole history there and including how my mother and father separated in the first place. And I was just furious at the way in which the system just gobbled them up and didn't provide the help that they needed. Uh, and I said to myself in my 18 year old commitment, one day I'm going to fix this. Wow. And I spent the rest of my life doing exactly that. Wow. Uh, that, that's, and it was a, it was a commitment. Uh, it was very, very important. It was very important to me personally. Um, but I also began to realize the more and more I did this work and I, when I went to college and then graduate school, you know, there was just no lots of information about single moms and kids, but no information about dads whatsoever. And at the time, researchers were creating longitudinal data sets where you could follow a families uh, and children over time from child to adulthood. But but essentially you could rarely follow boys from childhood into adulthood, particularly boys who grew up poor because um, the U.S. income security system doesn't, you know, it does. It supports mothers and children, but it generally doesn't support fathers. So, if you had a child who grew up who grew up in a poor household, uh, you couldn't tell what happened to him as an adult because if he turned out being poor, then he would not have access to housing assistance, medical assistance, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and you couldn't observe what was, uh, you know, what what the outcome was. And so, um, it was that, um, you know, series of of, of you know, things, including the things I learned as a graduate student, uh, that that led me to, you know, commit myself to this career and open up um, this unknown uh, can of uh, uh, set of issues around what happens to uh, uh, boys to men when they grow up without their fathers. Yeah, and I think that's you know when I think about you and I think about you know what I've seen you do and how you do it. One of the things that I know um i've taken from you um as a strength that has become my own now is to really kind of think about this stuff um to really analyze it and look at it and not be so be frustrated by it but not be driven by your emotions to the extent that you can't see what's happening in front of you mm -hmm. how often do you um do research and come across things that um almost trigger you into thinking that you still have not gotten as far as you have wanted to get based on seeing those files? Well, um, 
I, I think I think rarely. I it, I rarely bemoan you know the progress that we haven't made because I've seen so much progress. Um, not not only in the research, uh, 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 but also in the policy. You know, my my good friend and former grantee, uh, Vicky Turetsky, who was uh, the uh, the commissioner of child support, the federal child support enforcement uh, in the Obama administration. You know, I used to call child support enforcement uh, a battleship. Right. And she said, Ron, do, do better than that. It, it, why don't you call it an ocean liner? And the idea is that, you know, the, the policy moves very slowly, but it does move. And I think the ways in which um, uh, child support enforcement interacts with with low income men uh, and y men who have children when they're young, before they have the, the maturity to know what that responsibility is all about. And before they have the education and and uh, and training, you know, to to have a decent job, um, uh, the the circumstances around the way public policy deals with them are very very different than they were certainly uh, in the in the nineteen uh, in the nineteen seventies when I was in that courtroom, uh, and and even over the past thirty years as I've been doing this work. So I'm very very encouraged. Uh, about the the changes that are occurring in public policy, in part because, uh, as our good colleague um, Elaine Sorensen, who you mentioned, you know the amount of debt, uncollectible debt that's in the child support enforcement system is is astronomical, and now it is really in the interest both of the federal government and of the states to get rid of a lot of that debt and to right size child support orders, and so now. Uh, it's my view that, you know, the interests of low income men and the people who care about them and the interests of policymakers are aligned around this. And then I think, uh, you know, my job in these days is to try to work with practitioners in order to help them understand that uh, 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 things are in better alignment. And then how do they help the, um, the, the fathers that they serve? Uh, how do they help them navigate the child support enforcement system, which is very, very complicated. And I keep returning to child support enforcement because that's how my work in this area started. But it's branched out uh, much more in part because of these data that you talk about um, uh, to better understand both the impacts of all of this on children uh, and on the and on the fathers themselves. So. Uh, Mm. Over the years, over the years of you doing this work, has your definition of fatherhood or what fatherhood or responsible fatherhood should be changed, meaning what you thought it was, you know, some years ago when you started and all of the research and now looking at the research, has that definition changed for you? If so, how? Um, well, uh, yeah, it, 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 it absolutely has, because, you know, I thought of fatherhood in much the same way. As, as as many Americans uh, use of my generation used to think about fatherhood and that was mainly about supporting you know your children and your your family financially now I have a better being a father and a grandfather I have a better fuller appreciation that yes it involves uh, financial provision but it also involves you know providing the love and care and security uh, that your father needs, that, that your family needs, and also being a better caretaker of your own health and your own mental health. Uh, and so uh, my understanding of it, both from the academic literature and from having had the privilege and the opportunity to uh, to have my own situation changed so that I've watched my children grow from 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 little little infants to boys to grown men, uh, I've been married for nearly 50 years. I have grandchildren and begin to watch them develop. You know, I think the responsibilities of, of, of a responsible father is, is, you know, what the scriptures say about uh, this is the word father means source. Uh, and, and, and therefore, uh, you're, you're a source for everything that your family needs. Uh, and, uh, and, and that includes taking care of yourself so that you can be around. I, I mean, one of the things I worry about, particularly in terms of black families, but now uh, more generally is the, uh, is the health uh, of, of men, particularly, uh, uh, well, black men in particular. Uh, I'm a cancer survivor twice over, uh, and the way in which we uh, eat, uh, exercise, or, or lack thereof, um, you know, the way we work, the consequences of that, uh, too many uh, black boys and girls grow up, you know, 
needing their fathers when they're 14, 18, 30 years old, uh, but their fathers die prematurely in part because they, they're, they're, our, our eating habits and our health habits you know, um, don't give us the longevity to, to, to be available to, to our children, not only when they're eight, but also when they're, they're, they're 38 or 50. You know? And so uh, those are the things that um, give me this more complete understanding of what a responsible father is. It, it's a lot. Yeah, you know, I um I've had the opportunity over the last 15 years now to travel the country doing this work in all corners of the country when you talk about this notion of focusing on black dads which is something, you know, I'll never let go of. I think there's a different kind of drilling down we have to do with respect to that I've been telling this story about both of us are from New York, you're from Manhattan, I'm from Brooklyn, so we know New York from two different perspectives as it relates to that, but somewhat similar. And I was telling someone after um, Richard Roundtree passed away um, mm -hmm. a couple of months ago, and I was talking about how in our neighborhood of Crown Heights, you know, during that black mm -hmm. exploitation period, that many of the examples of men and fathers were people like him who played um, mm -hmm. John Schaff and mm -hmm. the Mac okay. and yeah, yeah. Truck Turner and Superfly mm -hmm. and even Bruce Lee, right? Jim Kelly, Jim mm -hmm. Brown, Fred Williamson, um, all of these guys that were tougher than nails kinds of men who we thought we should be. And then some years later, this character emerged from Calabrini Green's projects in Chicago named John Amos, who played James Evans. <laughs> and he changed how poor kids looked at men mm -hmm. with the understanding that you could still be tough as nails and still have a commitment to hang in there um, with your family and make your family work. Over the years, what have you seen as the biggest challenge for fathers um, to be all they desire to be? Well, um, you know, I, I, I just, uh, in part, uh, this comes from my own history because I had brothers and sons. I never had, I didn't have sisters, you know. Uh, you know, I, I love my mother. She lived until she was 96. And like I said, I've been married most of my adult life. But other than that, and now I have this granddaughter, and she's like a complete mystery to me. So, but but I, I really think that in a lot of ways, um, our our society doesn't honor and pay attention to in a lot of ways. The the we have this. I, I wrote this paper at one point. Um, we have this notion that you know men are dominant figures in our society, uh, and 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 we are. The, the medical profession, et cetera, et cetera, the employment world pays attention to the needs of men and neglects the needs of, of women in a lot of ways. But I think um, I think that may be true, but it's, it's complicated because when you think about it, it's not a, this bifurcation of men versus women. It's really, uh, you know, white men, men of color, right? And then when you come to men of color and the needs of men of color are not attended to, uh, they're not... Um, there's not a, a, a great deal of, of uh, medical research, uh, 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 you know, employment. We, we still haven't cracked the nut about uh, how do you enable um, less educated men, men who don't graduate from, from high school or college, how to transition that so that they end up getting back uh, and successfully in terms of secure employment and se secure earnings. So I think, you know, uh, men of color have been at the bottom of, as it were, the totem pole in, in the ways in which our society pay attention to the needs of people. Uh, and as a result, um, you know, that that's a, an outcome with which I'm still very disappointed. But things have changed in a lot of ways. So a couple of years ago, I was writing a, a paper for the Peter G. Peterson Foundation. And one of my... Uh, the, uh, the discussion who critiqued the paper, you know, it was focusing on 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 um, the employment and earnings outcomes of low income men of color. And what he pointed out to me, which I had to do my own investigation, is that in lots of ways, many less educated white men are experiencing the same challenges that black men experienced, you know, decades ago. Uh, they are um, if they've not gone to college, their earnings have barely increased in the last uh 
you know, in since the mid 1970s, only recently have we seen increases in their average hourly earnings. Uh, and many of them, while uh, uh, you know, marriage rates are down in the society generally, uh, and as a result, there's a lot of of uh, single parent. The major generator of single parent families now in the United States is cohabitation and the breakup, the early breakup. Of, of cohabitation. And so while lots of white children are raised in single parent families through a process that's very similar to what was happening to, to, to uh, black and Latino men decades ago. And so in a lot of ways, uh, we are revisiting or, uh, you know, it's like, a, I, I think black people were like, uh, around these family issues, were like the, the canary in the minefield. The problems that were really uh, significant and um, and uh, for black children because of what was happening to black men, um, you know, 40 years ago are now quite spread quite generally throughout the society. Uh, and if you're a less educated white man and you latch on to that, uh, the, the, the opioid addiction, uh, we are now be, as a society becoming more sensitive to the issues and the concerns of less educated men and their children, in part because these issues are now facing the society generally. Uh, and so I think that's one of the biggest changes that have occurred. Yeah, we just did a training not too long ago um, with um, CPS workers in West Virginia. Okay. And your point about the opioids, my God, it's like, yeah. you know, you kind of knew of it, but you didn't know to that extent until you're smack dab in the middle of it and you see it right in front of your face and you're talking to these parents and you're looking at them. It's like they, man, I don't even know how to describe it. And then a good friend of mine who is a professor, uh, we were having a conversation about people. She was born in the app in the um, Southern Hills of the Appalachian yeah. mountain. Yeah. Um, and she said, you know, there's a poor society in America that America hasn't seen yet and they mm -hmm. ignore Mm -hmm. um, and once we begin to start seeing that poverty is poverty, yep. it looks different, but it's the same everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, we won't be able to fully understand the need um, for un un underserved and, and deserved populations of this country. Yeah, You're involved in the um, a co-principal in the Fragile Families and Child Wellbeing Study. I'm sure some of this, what you're talking about, comes from that. Talk about what that is, because I don't think people really understand the significance of that study. Well, first of all, um, the the study, again, when I was a graduate student, uh, you could not study the youth to adult transition of, of, of essentially black boys because, um, uh, you know, they if they are poor, uh, then they don't head their own households. They don't have custody of their own children. And our U.S. income security system has not treated them well. Uh, and therefore, uh, they don't necessarily have access to housing. And so when you have uh, survey uh, enumerators and they go out and they're interviewing families, they're rarely going to encounter men. And as a result, we, we, we know, you know, as a graduate student, the data that we were generating, uh, that studies were generating, just uh, skipped over the conditions that I wanted to understand better. You know, and, and my question as a research, uh, young researcher was basically, why did, my 17 year old question was, why did black men desert their families? And in the, uh, the, the data that we were generating, you could not study that. And so, um, but uh, in the 1990s, uh, I worked in the Clinton administration uh, briefly. I had an opportunity to work on the, what was called the non-custodial parent uh, income, uh, non-custodial parent income group. Uh, it was my responsibility to help figure out what the Clinton administration's policies were going to be about in child support reform, and uh, which is, you know, the second cousin of welfare reform. And uh, so I had the opportunity in a way to, uh, to, to honor my 17 year old commitment, I'm going to fix this. Uh, and so, but, you know, I didn't get a big time job as an assistant secretary, but I did, you know, talk about these issues. And then I had an opportunity to work in the Ford Foundation. Uh, and in that, my responsibilities were 
uh, basically to understand and to uh, recommend grants around welfare reform because the Ford Foundation had played a critical role in welfare reform for decades. Uh, and then when I learned how to do that, uh, I then turned my attention to child support reform uh, and then began to uh, recommend grants that were intended to do three things, to build the research, to build the policy, and to build the practice around child support reform. Uh, and part of that research was to create what I called at the time um, uh, the future of uh, the, the, the fragile families and child well-being study. It was, I worked with my colleagues, uh, Sarah McClanahan, who was at Princeton University at the time, and our, her husband, Irv Garfinkel, uh, and over a, a, a tuna dinner, I shared with them this idea of, of creating a birth cohort study that would track mothers, fathers and children, about 5,000 of them, uh, children, and their mothers and fathers, to answer the question, um, what, how did the circumstances of the parents, and whether or not they stayed together, their education, their employment, etc., influence the outcome of these children? And so we've been following these 5,000 children for now close to 22, 22 years, uh, and have, um, and this study has revolutionized the way uh, economists and sociologists and family policymakers uh, and researchers understand what we used to call single parent families. Uh, at the time, I called this study the Fragile Families and Child Well-Being Study. Uh, and, you know, back in, the, back in the day, if you had a package delivered to you for Christmas and it had some delicate material in it, they would have, they have this sign on it. It would say, fragile, handle with care. And so my understanding of the thing is that right now, going back to my mother's case, public policy did not handle these families with care. And so that's the signal that I've been, uh, that I wanted to put out there. And um, we've uncovered some remarkable uh, uh, understanding of low income moms and dads and their children as a consequence of this study. And more recently, uh, there is a new uh, cohort of leaders uh, behind the study, the name has been changed to the Future of Families and Child Wellbeing Study, and it is the only longitudinal data set, the longest longitudinal data set in the United States that tracks moms, dads, and their kids in order to figure out again how do how do the circumstances, not only the circumstances of mom and dad, but their environment, uh, their uh, their genotype, gene, gene environment interaction. We have data on their toxicity, et cetera, et cetera, of the communities in which they live. And we have a better understanding then of, of uh, how the circumstances of, of in which children grow influences their, uh, their well-being. And it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it, it turned out better than my wildest dreams and, uh, and has influenced the way policymakers think about these issues and researchers think. And then I still am engaged with lots of uh, young researchers who are using these data to understand my question and others. Mm. The um, case for Negro action, um, the Monaghan report, um, in your estimation, did the Fragile Family Study expand on that, build on that, elaborate on that, correct that? What is the differences between the two? Well, um, I think in, in, in lots of ways, uh, it, it has certainly expanded on the themes of the Moynihan Report, which were all about this notion that, uh, that, that, the, that the challenging circumstances of Black families and children were an outgrowth of what, and, and what Moynihan said versus the way in which um, the climate in which what he said was interpreted and the reaction to that uh, you know, it, it was very, very different. What he said was that uh, that black, and this was uh, basically a, a comment that he picked up from a black sociologist, right, uh, who talked about how there is a tangle of pathologies among black families, and he he Moynihan pointed to the circumstances of black men, which were largely the result of discrimination, right? Uh, how those circumstances compromise the outcome of black women and children. And I think uh, in many ways he was right, uh, uh, but um, the articulation of that uh, in the time was that, you know, uh, people viewed what he said as if he were blaming the victim and never really paid attention to the argument that he was making 
namely uh, blaming discrimination against men of color as the root cause of the challenges that they face and that in turn their families fell victim to. And, and I would say that one of the things as part of my own story is as I grew older and understood the circumstances that my father faced as a black GI in the 1950s who, uh, first of all, you know, I grew up in New York City. I, I live now uh, just a, a bike ride away from the, uh, the police precinct where that famous scene was, where Malcolm X, you know, turns the head of all these men uh, and, and this black man was being arrested and held and beat up in that precinct. Uh, and lots of men of that generation, first of all, they fought for the privilege of fighting for this country and had every expectation that on the other side of that, they were going to be honored for the, for the, for the extraordinary work that they did in the Korean War and in World War II, only to come back and to find that they faced the same kinds of discrimination they had before the war. And you see um, large amounts of alcoholism, uh, that were a consequence of their reaction uh, to the way in which they were treated at the end of the war. Uh, and, and that circumstance, you know, continued to go on in the Vietnam War and the like. And so I began to better understand um, uh, how the circumstances that my dad faced led to, uh, you know, the, the challenges between him and my mom uh, and left me as a single, uh, as a child, wondering, why do black men desert their kids? Uh, and that helped me better understand and first of all, to forgive him. And secondly, then to begin to do the work so that uh, other children would not face the same circumstances that I faced. And, and secondly, that lots of men of color would not face that same situation as well. And so um, in, a, in a way, you know, this has been a, a life's work, but it's also been healing. Uh, healing for myself uh, and and healing for my relationship with my with my father and um and and again wanting things to be better for 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 black families and black children uh, and um and and again uh, throughout because I've studied these things carefully I understand that things aren't perfect but they're a whole lot better than they were uh, before we all began this work and and uh, you know and and the and the and the people who have gathered around this. Uh, uh, including, you know, when I was at the Ford Foundation, I missed something because because my program was about research, policy, and practice. Uh, I didn't do much, and it was difficult for foundations to do advocacy and communications, which uh, you know, which you do and you do very effectively. But uh, but even that area is a growing, um, you know, even what we're doing now is a growing part of the work that has to be done. Kenny, you're muted. Somehow. Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, you walked right into where I was going, <clears throat> which is, you know, now that we are learning so much about families and 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 learning about their behaviors and their outcomes and even a lot about their aspirations and what they want to do and in, in terms of families and dads. Um, as we kind of take all of this information and convert it into practical knowledge um, for service. Um, for mm -hmm. practitioners, uh, what have you seen to be some of the best practices out there and strategies that people are doing to work specifically with fathers, but more generally with families? Well, um, uh, the, the one thing I, I see is that we are, again, uh, you mentioned that at this at the beginning of our talk, that, um, you know, this conversation used to be framed as a zero-sum game. Uh, uh, anything that you do for men... Uh, even if it's in the in the long run in the cause of helping uh, women and children, anything you do for them has to be taken out of the mouths of mothers, right? And so, we, you know, we had to had to fight that battle throughout. I think there's much less of that going on now. Um, I think uh, second that that we now can have a genuine conversation about uh, helping mothers, helping fathers, helping children, and not fall into this trap where where the only conversation that we're able to have is where men, men's groups and women's groups are pitted against one another uh, in our efforts to help families. So uh, I, I think that 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 concern still bears watching, uh, but I think it's much less of a concern now than it was sort of when we started this work 30 years ago. I think the other thing that um, that is 
sort of behind the conversation, uh, 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 an impediment that we've left, left behind is this war between um, uh, uh, people in this area, policymakers, researchers who were warring against this notion that the only way to fix this problem is through marriage. And then others are arguing that no, actually, uh, people can be competent parents even if they're even if the romance is done. So I think um, there are there are uh, you know there there are people uh, and experts and policymakers who are still on both sides of that debate. But it's not as if you either have to do one or the other. Uh, there are uh, people who are trying to do work around both. And I think both in the research and increasingly in the practice. There is this notion about um, about uh, cooperative parenting or co-parenting. How do you help? Uh, you know, it is still the case that more than seventy percent of Black children are are raised in households without their biological mom and dad. So you have parents who come together; they're romantically involved, uh, uh, and and this is irrespective of race anymore. And then the romance is done. So the father, uh, usually moms have custody of the children. The father leaves or gets kicked out. And then they have to figure out, well, we still have this child in common. How are we going to jointly uh, participate in that child's development and well-being? And so there is increasingly work trying to theoretically uh, think through this notion of co-parenting to borrow uh, things that can be borrowed from co-parenting around divorced couples to co-parenting around couples who have been who have never been married in the first place. And I think in my mind, that is a very necessary uh, conversation, figuring out, uh, first of all, how to help moms and dads who have been romantically involved and who have not forgive one another so that they can focus on the needs of their children uh, and the fact that their, their children are always going to know, want to know what is my relationship to my biological mom and biological dad. No matter who else comes in the picture, they want to know. They want to answer this question uh, so that they can be whole, as it were, and, and figuring out, because it's happening to so many families, uh, again, not necessarily because of the growth in divorce, but because of the growth in cohabitation. Uh, now, children are increasingly going to grow up uh, without their biological mom and dad living in the same household. And therefore, uh, we have to figure out ways of helping parents to co-parent their children after the romance is done. And, uh, and, and I think that's one of the more exciting areas, promising areas in the research and practice uh, that, that is taking place. Uh, I've been involved in, in, in an early version of it with my colleague, uh, Cleo Caldwell at the, um, at the University of Chicago and, uh, uh, sorry, at the University of Michigan and uh, uh, a former mentee of mine, uh, uh, Professor Waldo Johnson and, uh, and you know, Kirk Harris uh, in Chicago, trying to figure out how do you help uh, mothers in a place like Chicago, right, which is very, a very high risk environment for boys, especially, how do you help them figure out once their romance is done, how to engage the father in the life of the child with mother's permission uh, and, and enable that father to build or rebuild his relationship with his children so that as they mature from eight to 12 years old, when they will experience uh, t uh, violence in their communities, substance abuse in their communities and early sexual debut. How can you help these parents, uh, the father, re-enter the, 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 the fray, as it were, and, and do what he needs to do to support that child? Uh, and so, but that kind of work um, uh, is the work I think that's the most exciting thing. And, uh, and oddly, you know, I've been uh, teaching in a school of social work for like uh, 20 some odd years. And oddly, there's very little family practice like that taught in the main places like schools of social work anywhere in the country right so it, it hasn't uh it, there's there's there is some work going on in the field right but mm -hmm. it, that work hasn't penetrated hasn't neither has much the work around fatherhood penetrated penetrated the academy uh mm -hmm. and uh and that's maybe the the next step yeah i'm often frustrated in doing direct service you know the lack of resources i even have in my own bucket um, to help these dads. And it's kind of like, I can't understand. And, and, and so I'm always furious in the creation space, right? Yeah. Because I can't 
you know, figure out why um, we haven't gotten here. But there is, and then there's these emergency, emerging um, things that I see that are come about as a result of working directly with these dads and listening to them every day and having mm -hmm. them call every day and being around them every day um, that I still believe that research still hasn't touched yet in a way that um, speaks to what many of these fathers are going through. And one of those areas is this whole notion of non-resident, right? And so we always talk about non-resident dads, but when we talk about non-resident dads, we talk about them in the space that we believe that they're just absent out of the lives of their children. That's not what non-resident means. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter and I, who's now um, 24 years old, I believe, she'll kill me if she no, I forgot to <laughs> so fast. And she's about <laughs> and so we were having a conversation a month or so ago, um, during a lunch or some we go out to eat together and we just have these long two hour conversations every time we talk. And we always talk about very intimate stuff. Mm -hmm. And I was saying to her and I said, you know, one of the interesting things that I found about being a dad and particularly being non resident that you know when she was about two years old her mother and i broke up but we made a decision that we were going to co-parent regardless of our romantic relationship and that's what we did um for um for all of her life but i said to her i said as good of a dad as you can be you can be there for every occasion every cheerleading practice every special moment every milestone there is still an element of parenting that for the most part a father feels absent in mm -hmm. and she said what do you mean dad i said do you know that i don't know what it's like to wake up in the morning and see you on a couch curled up in a blanket watching tv mm -hmm. i said do you know that for the most part i don't know what it's like for you to come home having a bad day mm -hmm. or don't know what it looks like for you to stand in the refrigerator with the door open. I said, these are very intimate things that are part of parenting. It's almost like mm -hmm. watching you walk for the first time. You know, the NRFC had this slogan one time, uh, don't miss a minute because you might miss a moment. Okay, and no, so okay. there are these moments that compound on each other when you are non-resident that has an impact on you over time because yeah. you've realized that you there's nothing you can do about non-resident except yeah. for being living in the same space. Yeah, and I yeah. often wonder, you know, for dads that are engaged because we don't talk about those dads, um, how much research is out there and how much more do we need to do on how children fare in blended families? Yeah. Well, but, but, but Kenny, there is, there is a, you know, the science of this is compromised in a way that I think is very unfortunate. And, th mm. and that is this, all the reasons that you suggest um, in terms of developing intervention research. Now I'm primarily uh, an observational researcher. You know, I do surveys, gather data, try to understand them and, uh, uh, and, and, and adjust for, make, you know, scientific adjustments for the quality of the data. But there are people who are intervention researchers and they, they, they work from theories of human development and then they go out and they uh, develop models of, of service provision, interventions based upon theory. Then they talk to the population if they're good. They talk to the populations they serve and say, well, I have this idea about how to create an intervention in order to help you engage with, with your children better, in this case, more effectively. Uh, and then between the conversation about, uh, you know, what theory suggests and what the population, uh, how they respond to the model, they revise the model and go out and test it. Um, one of the big challenges with respect to non-resident fathers is that researchers have a disincentive in engaging non-resident fathers in these types of interventions because they, they are up against the following threat. Um, they will raise $1.5 million to do an intervention with non-resident, engaging a non-resident father. Uh, but they never know whether or not um, uh, the relationship between the mom and the dad will go sour in some way 
that will prevent the father from executing on the protocols that they develop for this intervention. Uh, or uh, the, the, the fathers that we're talking about, you know, they not only have challenges with their partners, but they also have challenges in the workplace. Uh, they also have challenges with their health, etc. In other words, um, when an intervention researcher develops an intervention to work with non-resident fathers and their kids uh, and, and, and the mothers of their kids uh, and, and, and trains the father, OK, uh, this is the this is this is what we are going to do in this uh, intervention for non-resident fathers. They the researcher doesn't know if on any given day the father is going to show up and actually execute the things that he has been trained on in order to interact with the child. And that means that uh, researchers who do this kind of intervention research um, have a disincentive of working with non-resident fathers. If they're gonna raise $1.5 million or $3 million to do an intervention, they're gonna do it with a married couple or they're gonna do it with a cohabiting couple because at least they know that the prospects of mom and dad showing up at the same place at the same time to execute the intervention, those prospects are good, right? And 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 uh, and what we need to do to figure out is, you know, to figure this thing out is to uh, is to take the risks associated with with that, uh, and that's what I'm excited about this work around uh, co-parenting and how it's evolving. My colleague, uh, our colleague, uh, Dr. Jeff Johnson, is working in this area particularly around uh, the Healthy Start programs, where what, he's, what they're trying to do, I understand, is they're working with couples, uh, parents who are separated, have long been separated. And what they do is they're working with a group of the moms who, who are, they, they are, they've had children in common, and they work with the moms around their grief, their anger about their partnership with the father. Uh, and then they're working with dads along the same thing. And out of that pool of people, they're selecting out uh, dyads who think they want to do this in spite of who've gotten over their 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 issues with one another and then they're then training them to see if they can again pull off ways of having these co-parenting relationships and then the research is also very interested in uh, these co-parenting things and then the question is um, what is public policy going to what's going to provoke public policy to to interest itself in that kind of intervention my own feeling is, as uh, rates of cohabitation rise, so that this becomes a bigger problem in the general population, not only among people of color, that's going to push the 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 um, that's going to push public policy over into the space. But uh, we'll see. Yeah, man, you said a lot. I'm not even going to go into that because we'd be for another thirty minutes. Uh, you 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 hit a lot of triggers on that because I'm thinking about our guys. You know, a couple of things that you know we say to them, and I think. You know, being literal in the language is important, too. With our dads, we are very I mean, even in my training, like you said something earlier about going into doing training and having to help them understand before you can even get to telling them what they want to know. Right. And so you get these grantees who say we can't recruit, we can't re we can't retain. Mm -hmm. and, then, and they want you to come in and give them the ABCs, one, two, threes of, right. you know, recruitment and retention. It's like, no, we got to spend about three hours talking yeah. about whether or not you even understand these dads, whether you mm -hmm. understand who you're dealing with before we could talk about um, recruitment and retention. And two of the things I say, five things, but two of them I'll say quickly, you know, and I say, you know, you have to kind of understand this and you have to kind to break your notion of how you look at terms because those terms are sometimes the things that um allow you to deceive what or allow you to perceive in the way that you do the first one is for every single mom there's a single dad why because mm -hmm. the literal definition of single mom is an unmarried mom so if there's mm -hmm. an unmarried mom there's an unmarried dad so why mm -hmm. aren't we talking about single dads in the same way that we think talk about single moms mm -hmm. the second thing is that there's no such thing as a fatherless child 100 mm -hmm. of all biological children on the face of this earth as a father is mm -hmm. not if he exists his mm -hmm. where he exists but if right. we never ask the question where we never get to dealing with the hole that's in the child who's looking for something that you keep telling them doesn't exist yes yeah. right 
And so these breaking down of these literal terms, even when you go to court, one parent walks out and they say, I won. The other one walks out and say, I lost. No one wants to walk out of the courts and feel like they lost their children, (laughs) not even fathers. And so we got to start changing these conversations. But Mm -hmm. as we round this out and we'll come back because there's so many other things I want to talk to you about. First of all, I want to know, how do you sleep? Like, when do you sleep? Like, if you sleep, give us that secret. That's what I want to know, because I know well, I'll put it this way. Um, my daughter in law, my daughter uh, is on my case about this very question. Uh, <laughs> you know, um, you know, uh, this is a lot of work. You know, this is this is a lot of work uh, over the last many, many years. Uh, I, I have this sleep pattern. I've become better at my sleep, first of all. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, sleep is very important. I've become better at my at taking care of my health. But um I usually, you know, go to bed, at, you know, toward uh, midnight-ish. I get a good four or five hours of sleep every single night, push it up to six, seven of late. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I get up, I uh, drink some, I I've, I've no longer use melatonin or any medication like that. I d- drink, you know, relaxing, uh, some kind of uh, relaxing tea. And I work for maybe an hour. Uh, and then I will go back to sleep. I get up early, four or five o'clock in the morning. Uh, do my do do my devotion, get myself before right before the Lord, and get it go to work and get it done. You know. <laughs> so I've been doing, and I did. I began to do that many many years ago because and, uh, I wanted to be available for my kids yeah, yeah. when they woke up. Right now, I didn't want to be the kind of father who who wasn't hands on. Although clearly, you know, you know traditionally, uh, you know, Flona did a a superb job raising our kids and i helped around the edges in as many ways as i could but i wanted to be available to them so i'd get up early in the morning before they woke up so that i could do my devotion so i could get my work started and then when they were up going crazy i'm i'm, I'm there hands-on not you know and so but um but as i've gotten older i've you know begun to understand the benefits of sleep uh and now i'm going to listen to my granddaughter who's going my sorry my daughter-in-law who's uh who uh, who is uh, a health she has real strong health expertise and uh and i'm falling in line so you know <laughs> wow i'm learning lastly lastly what's your hope for the field what's your hope for the work itself well my hope for the work itself is first of all um that it become more institutionalized uh that because what i worry about is because of the challenges in funding the work and this is every aspect of the work the research the policy the practice the advocacy everything um we end up losing expertise uh we we end up you know uh i've had the privilege of influencing lots of people in this field and i count that as a privilege and a blessing but i also know that there's a lot of debris in the field uh, mm. programs in in in, in localities in part because of the federal grants that get funded in this round of funding. Uh, they, they recruit a staff, begin to develop uh, people who have not only interest but knowledge in the area. So many practitioners in the fatherhood field uh, were people who had fatherhood challenges of their own uh, and then you know got invested in the area and they were effective because they could look in the eye of a father who's experiencing challenges and say, don't tell me how hard it is. I've been there myself, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, in the next cycle, they don't get funded, and as a consequence, that 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 uh, development and training, that experience that a person acquires, that person's got to go out and find a job and feed himself and his family, so they get lost to the field. And so, uh, you know, my hope is that um, is that you know we put the funding around this on a more solid footing, uh, that 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 more uh, foundations would come back, private philanthropy would come back in the field. Uh, so that in addition to public dollars, we would also have private dollars at stake. And again, I really do believe that, you know, it's like, the look, I have a colleague. I have a colleague who has an $80 million grant around opioid addiction. Bless her heart, right? Wow. Why? Right? Because the opioid crisis began to affect white folks, right? Mm. And and it became, in the, in the words of, uh, oh, co- come on, um, I'm blanking on the governor of New Jersey. New Jersey. Uh, it became a national health crisis, right? Once, once it began to affect white people, it became a national crisis, and we're throwing money at it in order to figure out how we're going to solve opioid addiction. I'm sorry, uh, but um, this issue of of 
children being raised without their fathers and the consequences of it, right? Both for the fa fathers, the mothers, and the children, it's becoming a national crisis because mm -hmm. uh, so many children are born to cohabiting couples who separate within the first five years of the child's life. And wow. so as that consequence gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we will have to uh, put more resources behind it. And um, uh, uh, I'm not uh, you know, ashamed to say that. Uh, and, and therefore, uh, we will have more of the resources that we need in order to solve these sorts of challenges. Um, uh, and, and with that, I, I just hope that uh, you know, practitioners like yourself, uh, who's good at communications, We'll continue to figure out ways of, of being in. You've done the work, being in the field and staying in the field and doing high quality work and engaging researchers in that work so that you have people who are good working with people, but you also have uh, people who are good at counting the impacts of the kinds of services that you provide. And uh, mm -hmm. so that, that's my hope for the field, that there would be more integration, there were more resources available, one, but there would be more integration of community-based practice on the one hand, informed by, by practitioners, but also engaging researchers who do intervention research, uh, like, uh, you know, like my, uh, uh, like some of the students I've worked with, including, uh, you know some students that we uh, that I've lost recently uh, in the tragedy we were sharing about this uh, mm -hmm. at, at our recent conference. So that's mm -hmm. my hope. But but again, uh, I go back to Vicky Turetsky's steam uh, you know steam liner. Right, this field is getting better. Um, I personally, you know, I I do a a workshop every summer. We've been doing this now for maybe 12, 15 years, training young researchers. Uh, in order to use these data that we are created, which is getting better and better and better. There are researchers who are black, white, Asian, a whole bunch of people there who are getting good at this. And, and so uh, and my hope is that not only in the research, but in the policy and practice, we will continue to, de to develop it. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, in, in the end, as I'm supposed to be retired and I'm going to figure out how to do that soon. Uh, but, um, you know, that we, I certainly think that I've had the privilege of leaving the field better than it was when I began. Uh, and now it's time for young bloods like yourself, you know, to continue to do the work. And, uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm very optimistic. Listen, I, um, I just had this conversation the other day around secession. Mm -hmm. I think that's something in another conversation that we yeah. have to have when you look around this space and you look at folks like yourself, myself, Joe Jones, Dr. Yep. Johnson, Jerry Tejo, yep. Kirk Harris, you know, you know, rest in peace, Howard Sullivan, and yep. and and others who <clears throat> have gone on, and yep. you kind of yeah, yep. there's a gap. If yep. you look through the field, there's a gap, you know, mm -hmm. between us and folks that are coming into the field that have not come into the field by way of. Um, building institutions, but have come into the field by way of working within other missions in yep. other organizations. And mm -hmm. so there is a dangerous cliff behind us if we don't figure out how to get individuals to, <clears throat> to your point, institutionalize the mm -hmm. work that they're doing. Um, because I also believe that that's one of the reasons that we have not gotten a lot of attention from philanthropic organizations, because the way that they fund these days are very different than the way they used to fund as a result, as it relates to outcomes, out, outcomes as opposed yeah. to output and impact. And you have to have institution in place in order right, to be able to prove. Yeah. And manage the money that it takes to do that. Right. And so that's a whole nother conversation. But Dr. Missy, thanks so much. I appreciate you um, giving me this time. And um, there's so many more things we could talk about. I want to lend conversation to as we continue to move forward. But I appreciate you just having this moment to speak about some of the things that I know are important to you. But I really want to take time, you know, in your schedule throughout the year to get deep on some of this more meaningful stuff, particularly as it relates to the research so that people can understand what they're looking for, what they're looking at, and how they can contribute to the data. I think there's so many 
unrecognized groups out there that are doing work that needs to be researched, um, mm -hmm. needs to be talked about and talked to. And I know it's about resources. I know what the issue is, but we got to find a way to bring those resources to the table so that we can look at some of these grassroots organizations out here that are doing this work that need to be spoken about, that are doing some phenomenal work in their small spaces, but not mm -hmm. recognized even by their own local community. So thank you yeah. so much. We continue this thank you. Yeah, and I want to thank all of my I Am Dad podcast listeners. Uh, we're starting the year off strong, y'all. Make sure you continue to watch us and view us on our YouTube station, on all the social platforms, I Am Dad podcast. Um, this is year three. We're walking into it. We're walking into 2024 um, to have serious impact on this work and families around the country. And that's my good friend, Art Mitchell, used to always tell me it's nice to be important. But you know what? It's much more important to be nice until next week. Peace out. Take care. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us. You've been listening to I Am Dad Podcast. We hope that you have been informed, encouraged you to think, or even inspired your heart for the love of dads. The conversation does not end here. Come back and join us next week. Same time, same place. Or you can continue the dialogue on our I Am Dad Facebook page. We also invite you to listen to past episodes, learn more about us, and keep up with special activities by visiting IamDadPodcast.com. That's IamDadPodcast.com. Until next time, I leave you with this reminder of manhood from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child... I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Because of this reminder, I will always understand that I am dad, period.